<laughs> so now our next stop is the mountains. Let's hurry and do something about that skull kid. This is Legendary Adventures, a Legend of Zelda playthrough podcast. This week we're bringing back spring to the mountains of Snowhead, but only after we round up a few more masks. Part 1. Three more masks. After defeating Adolwa in the Woodfall Temple, the poisoned water of the swamp clears. The Deku Princess informs Link that her butler has prepared something for Link as a sign of gratitude. It's found in a shrine to the right of the Deku Palace as you leave. I was aware from my past playthrough that this was a race, and I'd wanted the bunny hood before tackling it. The hood is found at Romani Ranch west of the swamp. However, a massive boulder blocks the entrance to the ranch, and without some serious explosive power, players have to wait until the third day for it to be cleared. So, to pass time, I first paid a visit to the Fearful Spider House. It's located to the north of the Deku Palace. Players need to burn a spider web in a doorway to venture inside. Once inside, we are met by a small dog and a person transformed into a spider. It's much like the family we found in the house of Skultula in Ocarina of Time. There are 30 gold Skultulas hidden inside the spider house. Our goal is to find and to defeat each spider and to collect the gold Skultula tokens they leave behind. Majora's Mask does not have a game-spanning collectathon in the same vein as Ocarina of Time or Link's Awakening. Instead, it has these shorter mini collectathons that are contained within a single location. Think the stray fairies within the dungeons, and there are two spider houses. I grabbed two magic beans before heading in to help me round up all the spiders. The spider house spans two stories and has six rooms. The largest room is in the center. In three instances, players will need to capture bugs in a jar and then release them near a patch of soft soil on a wall to reveal a spider. Multiple spiders are hidden in beehives. Two are hidden in large indestructible pots that can only be revealed by rolling into the pots. The reward for finding all the spiders is the Mask of Truth. This is one of the few masks which returns from Ocarina of Time. In both games, it's used to talk to gossip stones. In Majora's Mask, it gains the added ability to talk to animals, specifically dogs, and it can be used to cheat on dog racing at Romani Ranch. Romani Ranch is home to a number of quests and mini-games. I paid a visit to only one location and one character on this visit. On the west side of the ranch, there are two buildings. One is the dog racing track. The other is the one I visited, the Cuckoo Shack. Inside, we meet Grog a character who looks suspiciously like the carpenter's son from Ocarina of Time, if he had a mohawk. Grog is upset because he won't be able to see his chicks grow up into roosters before the moon crashes into Termina. We can help him by donning the Bremen mask. With this mask on, Link marches around and plays a lively tune on Ocarina. As we march, we can gather up each of the chicks, which will line up behind Link and parade around with him. Once all of the chicks are gathered, they will turn into roosters one by one. Grog says seeing his chickens fully grown leaves him with no regrets. He rewards Link with the bunny hood. This is another returning mask from Ocarina of Time. Here in Majora's Mask, it makes Link move faster when he wears it. I then went back to the swamp and entered the shrine to the west of Deku Palace. We can only enter after the water has been cleared of poison. Otherwise, a giant octo blocks the door. The butler says he will lead us to an item they prepared for Link as a thank you. What follows is a race similar to the race with Dompe the Gravekeeper in Ocarina of Time. This one is more elaborate. The butler moves quickly and we must move quickly to keep up in order to obtain the prize. This race is much more complex than the race with Dompe. There are a variety of obstacles, including a number of water hazards, a fire barrier maze like the one found in the Fire Temple in Ocarina of Time, and platforming challenges. I switched back and forth between Link's Deku form and human forms a couple of times. In human form, I would wear the bunny hood. It makes it easier to keep up, especially during the platforming sections. For completing the race, players are awarded with the Mask of Sense. It heightens Link's sense of smell in order to track down mushrooms that can be used to make blue potions. Part 2. The Mountains of Snowhead
The mountains are located north of Clocktown. Players don't have to travel far to reach a snowy region. It's covered in mushroom-shaped rocks and has Dodongos wandering around. The entrance to the mountains proper is blocked by a massive sheet of ice. It locks this area off to anyone who does not have the bow. We need to shoot a massive icicle to break the ice and then proceed forward. There's also a row of boulders made out of snow that we'll need to bomb in order to advance to the mountain village. Despite being called the mountain village, there's really not much of a village here. There's a single cabin that is home to a pair of swordsmiths. We'll visit them in the next episode. At the village, we hear the mountain variation of Majora's theme. A wind-like sound effect drones in the background while sickly bell-like instruments take the melody. The counter melody is only barely audible. There are occasional choral notes adding extra flavor. From the village, we can access the road to Snowhead Temple or Goron Village. Snowhead can only be accessed by a Goron, so we first need to head to the village. Along the way, I met Tingle and bought a map for the region. Not far from where we met Tingle, we find the Goron Village, which has a familiar musical theme. Most of the Gorons are found inside the Goron Shrine. Upon entering, it's clear that not only are the Gorons freezing to death, but they're being driven mad by a crying baby. The baby is the son of the Elder. We're told he headed off to Snowhead to address the unnatural cold, but hasn't returned. Fun fact, according to English scriptwriter Jason Lung, script supervisor Mitsuhiro Takano also voiced the crying baby Goron. On the east side of Goron Village, we meet the owl Kepora Gabora. The owl warns if Link does not act, the Goron land will forever be covered in snow and ice, becoming a place where no living thing can survive. The owl directs Link to a shrine located across a seemingly impossible to cross gap. The owl says it will lead Link to the shrine, and it flies across, dropping feathers onto otherwise invisible platforms. We can use these to jump across. Inside the shrine, we find the Lens of Truth. This functions much as it did in Ocarina of Time. We can use it to see invisible treasure chests, enemies, platforms, and false walls. We use the Lens of Truth to make our way back to Goron Village. From the shrine, we're sure to see a ghostly Goron. He asks Link to follow him and leads him back to the mountain village. We need to use the Lens of Truth to see a maze-like ladder hidden under the snow on a cliff face. At the top, we find two Gorons and the entrance to the Goron Graveyard. One of the Gorons is frozen solid. The other is also cold. He tells us that there's a hot spring inside the graveyard, but it's been stopped up by the gravestone of the warrior Darmani. Inside the graveyard, the ghost introduces himself as Darmani III. He was a once great warrior. He died when he went to Snowhead to challenge a demon which was wreaking havoc on Goron Village. Darmani says he was blown into the valley by the blizzard on Snowhead, killing him. He asks Link to bring him back to life, or at the very least, to heal his sorrows. That's our hint to play the Song of Healing. Playing the song eases Darmani's regret. We see a vision of a crowd of Gorons cheering for Darmani as golden tears stream from his eyes. His spirit transforms into the Goron Mask. Wearing this mask transforms Link into Darmani. In the form of Darmani, Link can perform powerful punches, roll with great speed, and curl into a ball to perform a ground pound. But he moves slowly, and he cannot swim well in Goron form. In place of an ocarina, Goron Link plays the drums. This is a nod to the real-life hobby of Eiji Onuma. He told Game Informer in 2015, You might notice that the Goron in Majora's Mask plays a sort of bongo-like instrument. I put that in there because it's something I personally enjoy. It really feels good to pound out a rhythm. Thanks to the earlier tip about the hot spring, I pulled back Darmani's gravestone and it again filled the graveyard with hot spring water. We're able to scoop this up into a bottle. We can then pour the hot water onto ice, melting it. It will cool down after a short time. We know the Goron Elder went to try to figure out how to stop the cold. We can find him frozen on the path outside of Goron Village. He's completely covered in snow and ice. We must first break the snow and then melt the ice to find him. Speaking to Nintendo Dream, Aonuma said, The location of the frozen Goron Elder changes depending on the day. This was apparently one way Anuma tried to work in some of the time management elements of Majora's Mask into his portion of the game. We need to speak to the Elder twice to learn a new song. Well, part of a new song. 
The Goron Elder lives up to his name and is truly elderly in appearance. He is at once huge and hunched, but strangely lean. He's uneasy on his feet, using his hands for extra support. He is distressed to hear his son misses him, but he also says he has work he needs to do. He teaches us the Goron Lullaby intro. He cannot remember the full song, but the intro is all we need for now. We return to the Goron Shrine and play the intro for the crying baby. He then sings the rest, teaching us the full song. This is one effective lullaby. All the Gorons in earshot are put to sleep by it. With the full lullaby, we can then proceed to the Snowhead Temple. Getting there requires using the Goron Roll ability to make a few big jumps off ramps. Snowhead Temple is contained within a mountain peak with massive icicles shooting out of the top. There's a spiraling ramp around the outside and we can see icy blasts of cold air that seem to shoot out the entrance. The blasts are actually from a giant invisible Goron. How or why he's invisible is unclear, but we can see him with the lens of truth. We can put the giant Goron to sleep with a lullaby, and thanks to a nearby owl statue, we can reset the clock and proceed to the dungeon. Part 3. Snowhead Temple In an Awada Asks interview for Majora's Mask 3D, Eiji Onuma said, The game was made for those who played Ocarina of Time. It's all a challenge to our players. It's like we're saying to them, can you clear this? The first time I ever played Majora's Mask, I answered that question with a firm no. I quit. The Snowhead Temple is the reason why. I've mentioned that I wound up completing the game years later with the release of Majora's Mask 3D. This, however, is my first time returning to the Nintendo 64 version. I can't say I particularly liked this dungeon while playing through it, but the more I think about it, the more I'm coming to appreciate its design choices. Let's start with the music. It's anchored by a wind sound effect. There are also cymbal crashes suggesting cracking ice. The melody is primarily played on keyboard, and there are occasional female choir vocals in addition to chimes that sound as though they were lifted straight from the ice cavern in Ocarina of Time. The dungeon spans five floors. Four floors are above ground, and one is in the basement level. While playing through, I felt like it was all a tangled knot of rims that I was constantly crossing and recrossing over and over again. Sort of a dry version of Ocarina of Time's Water Temple. Watching back through my playthrough and paying attention to the critical path, I can see how, yeah, it's still full of knotted looping paths, but it's actually directing the players through those knots in a clever way, and is designed to avoid some of the frustrations of the water temple. After entering the temple and pushing a block out of the way, players will reach three doors. One white, one red, one blue. The white door is locked and requires a key. The red door is covered in ice, meaning the blue door is the only path forward. Through the blue door, players will have to take note of a large chunk of ice that will have to be melted later. They'll also have to use the Goron Roll to jump over a broken bridge. Falling here will only result in players falling one floor, and then returning to try again is pretty simple. The Goron Roll is essential for getting around the upper floors, and this is a little practice area that hints at later use, allowing players to make sure they can do it properly. Later on, the drop will be much more dramatic. On the other side of the bridge, players come to a fork in the road. A stairway leads up to a room on the second floor. This room contains the map, and a platform that is obviously intended to move, but we can't make it move just yet. The room will be essential for getting around later in the dungeon. Placing the stairs here and forcing the players to immediately loop back allows them to note this room for later. Through a second blue door, we reach the main room of the dungeon. It spans all five floors, and it will be a frequent point of return and navigation challenge. When we first enter, two green doors and a red door are covered in ice. A yellow door is unobstructed, clearly hinting the players that's the way to go. Inside the yellow room, players will move a pair of stacked blocks to find a key. Then, with nowhere else to go, it's back to the main room. 
We're then supposed to use the bow and a torch placed next to the red door to melt the ice. This will loop us back to the first room, and we can go through the locked white door. The path found through the white door will eventually take us to the second floor. All the while, players should notice large chunks of ice that need to be melted, but that can't be melted at this moment. On the second floor, there's a standout puzzle involving raising and lowering pillars to form platforms. This made me stop and think for a bit. The room is divided by a trench which Link can climb out of only on one side. Players must use a ground pound on a large yellow switch to raise up pillars. One pillar creates a platform which Link can use to jump across the trench. The other pillar blocks the room's exit. To get out, players must raise a second, shorter pillar inside the trench. It's on a timer. So players have to quickly ground pound the yellow pillar they used to cross the trench back into the ground, lowering the pillar in front of the exit. Then they must quickly jump up onto the green pillar and use it to exit the trench and the room. This takes us back to the main room. There are four walkways and four doors with a gap in the center. We must use the Goron roll to jump traveling south to north. The northern door is blocked by ice, so we must again use the Goron roll to cross a banked wall and travel north to east. A door on the east leads back to the map room. We can also clearly see a frozen eye switch, but there's still not much to do here. Goron rolling east to west takes us to a room with the first mini-boss of the dungeon. It's Wizrobe. This classic Zelda enemy sat out of Ocarina of Time, but returns here as a recurring mini-boss. The Wizrobe teleports between fixed points in the room, attacking with freezing magic. We need to be able to quickly determine where it is and then hit it. I shot it with arrows. It eventually begins to make fast-moving duplicates which dart around the room to confuse players. I actually had to use a red potion to get through this fight. Once the whiz rope falls, players are awarded with the dungeon item, the fire arrows. This is a curious detail of Majora's Mask. The bow is awarded in Woodfall Temple, and all other dungeons contain elemental arrows. Much like the Lens of Truth, all other pieces of equipment that Link will use are acquired outside of the dungeons. From here, the next step is to actually loop back to the first floor. If players use the fire arrows to melt the ice on the north door of the second floor, they'll quickly run into a locked door. This is a nice change from the Water Temple, which allowed players to travel for quite a while before running into a locked door and being forced back to an earlier area. On the first floor, we can melt the ice from the green doors. Through the doors, we have to navigate a platforming challenge and light a few torches to reach a switch which raises a massive pillar up the center of the main room. Once the pillar is raised, it changes the way we move through the dungeon. We can't simply walk across the main room as we did before, and we can't jump the gaps on the second floor either. Those gaps just aren't there anymore. We need to remember which rooms connected to which in order to get around. The map room is the only viable path up to the second floor right now. On the way there, we can melt the massive ice block and destroy three Freezard enemies to make a chest appear with a key inside. This is the key needed to progress. In the map room, we can shoot the ice-encased ice switch to raise the elevator platform, which allows us to exit onto the east of the main room on the second floor. We then cross the banked snow wall to the north, melt the ice, and proceed up to the third floor. We roll across the banked wall on the north side of the room to the west to pass through a locked door. Then we pass through a room packed with snow enemies and proceed up a set of stairs to the fourth floor. Here we fight a pair of Dinofuls. This is the point where I realize Majora's Mask discarded the one-on-one -on -one fighting rule for Z-targeting from Ocarina of Time. The Dinofuls that I was not targeting did breathe fire at me. It was noticeably less aggressive than the one I was targeting, but it did not just patiently wait its turn. Majora's Mask keeps most of its encounters like this to just a single enemy, so it's not super noticeable, but it is noticeable here. Exiting the Dinofuls room takes us back to the main room on the fourth floor. We take a straight shot path west to east to the second mini boss fight. It's a rematch with Wizrobe. This time it has more points it can appear on, and I actually had an easier time with this second go around. After defeating Wizrobe, we can pass through another door to obtain the boss key. Then it's time to loop back down again. The path to the boss room is actually accessed on the third floor, but the pillar is currently blocking it. We can't just lower the pillar because we need to walk across a platform in order to access the correct path. So players need to drop down and knock out some light blue sections of the central pillar to get it into proper position. This involves dropping down into the right location and remembering how to navigate back to the proper position. 
We can then plow through some snow boulders and reach a set of stairs that will take us to the fifth floor and the boss door. Recounting the critical path this way makes it sound a lot more straightforward. Is that necessarily how I played through the dungeon? No. I mean, I melted the ice on the red door immediately instead of going straight through the yellow door. I also resent the central pillar once because I thought I had messed up the puzzle, but on second thought, I don't really think that I did. Anyway, let's get on to the boss. Here we face Goat, the masked mechanical monster. While the Snowhead Temple is not ever going to be on my personal list of top Zelda dungeons, its boss is a contender on my list of best bosses in the series. This is a unique fight unlike others we've seen in the series so far. We have to use our fire arrows to first free Goat from ice, then use the Goron roll ability to chase the boss around a circular arena and crash into it to deal damage. Goat fires electrical attacks, and the more damage it takes, the more obstacles begin to fall in the arena, including stalactites and bombs. This is an incredibly fun fight, and I enjoyed every minute until Goat fell. After defeating Goat, we can collect a heart container and Goat's remains. Afterwards, Link finds himself in that strange spiritual realm again. Another giant stands in the distance surrounded by fog. It identifies itself as a guardian. Link and Tattle are then returned to the mountain to find that spring has finally arrived. Before signing off, here's a few stray thoughts on stray fairies. In every dungeon within Majora's Mask, there are 15 stray fairies to collect. For me, most weren't too hard to find within Snowhead. The Lens of Truth was required to find four of them. In three of those Lens of Truth locations, there's a patch of snow visible on the wall that spills over an otherwise invisible ledge. I felt clever in noticing that, but that was the point, wasn't it? The fourth was hidden inside the ceiling. It's inside the room with the floor pillars that we have to raise and lower in order to exit. I never thought to look up at the ceiling, especially not using the Lens of Truth, and I actually broke down and used a walkthrough to find this one. Otherwise, I felt like the stray fairies were a reasonable challenge to find within this dungeon. The fairy fountain itself is located at the base of the Snowhead Mountain, just below the dungeon, and the fairy awards a magic meter upgrade. Next week, we'll do some exploring in the spring weather, have a close encounter of the third kind, and take on the Great Bay Temple. If you want to follow along, please subscribe. If you've subscribed already, thank you. I really appreciate you liking this podcast enough to subscribe. I'm Paul Riley, and I'll see you next week.